So, here's the challenge. I'm gonna go through about a decade worth of football history in about 45 minutes. So I had a visual aid prepared so that I can help me keep time and you guys keep up. Most of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about is probably familiar to some of you, uh, but many of these things may not be familiar to any of you, including some of the anecdotes about some of my favorite players in the National Football League. So let's start. I went through the Presidential Library earlier and I noticed there were a number of pictures of Teddy Roosevelt. What many people don't realize is how important Teddy Roosevelt is to football. He didn't play. Uh, stories are that he was a very small child and as a frail young man, he didn't have the ability to play this sport that required you to run into each other and knock each other out. But he became a real big fan of it because it showed how you had the ability to express your courage and, and prepare yourself for battle on the field and he liked the strategy behind it. So. His sophomore year at Harvard University, he got a chance to see uh, one of the second intercollegiate games that were played in the uh, college ranks in the United States of America. 1876, he got a chance to see Harvard play Yale, in the first Harvard-Yale game. Uh, he was in the stands watching that day. And later in life, when Teddy Roosevelt became Teddy Roosevelt of the Rough Riders, 10 of the young men who rode with him in the Rough Riders listed their official profession as professional football players. Right. Interesting. Well, why is that important? See, that's part of the pre-1900s. See, football's been around in this country since around 1870 in the professional ranks. Many of the leagues that were around at that time were developmental leagues or mill town leagues. They were played for personal pride. You would go home from the mill, you would put on your leather hat and your sweater that represented your part of town, and you would play against the town next door. And you would try to figure out whether you could beat those guys next door. And then after you beat those guys next door, you'd all go for a drink. It was a derivative of rugby. It was brought over from England, and the guys were making up the rules as they went. Uh, and then it got adapted and molded for the college game with the first intercollegiate football game happening between Rutgers University uh, and uh, Rutgers University in 1869. Uh, when Rutgers University played in the game, one of the cheers that was yelled at the players on the field, you won't have a Christian end if you keep playing that way, young man. Right. So in 1905, the game of football changed. By this point, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was no longer a rough rider. He was no longer a strawny young man at Harvard University or pr prior to Harvard University. He's now the president of the United States of America. And as the president of the United States of America, he became really concerned because in that year, 19 young men died playing college football. Now, if you can imagine, college football wasn't that big of a sport. There weren't that many colleges or universities that were playing it. And the best and the brightest from around the country had been sent off to these colleges and universities so that they could improve themselves, improve their minds, improve their bodies. But they were dying playing football. So the president of the university thought this was important enough that he called together some of the best minds in football, including Walter Camp, who was the athletic advisor at Yale University and who many think is the father of modern day rules in football. And they had a conversation there at the White House. I thought this part was appropriate since we're right next to the presidential library. And in 1905, that conversation went something like, hey, we have to do something to save sport. In an article that was written after, uh, the, after the meeting happened, Roosevelt himself was quoted as saying, I have no sympathy whatsoever with the overwrought sentimentality that would keep a young man in cotton wool, and I have a hearty contempt for him if he counts a broken arm or a collarbone as a serious consequence when balanced against the opportunity to show he possesses hardihood and courage through football. But we must come up with an orderly set of rules so that this great game can be protected on our college campuses and so that we may move forward in our, fan, in our, in our enjoyment of this great game. Out of that meeting, those men left with a charge to figure out a way to create a uniform set of rules that would help football become better loved around the country. Yes, the President of the United States said, you shouldn't be upset if you break your arm or your collarbone if you're playing football. Instead, he wanted all the young men to have the ability to play football so that they can prepare themselves for the life that they would live thereafter. 
As an outgrowth of that meeting, those same gentlemen went up to New York. They called together some other colleges and universities and created what was eventually to become the National Collegiate Athletic Association. So why do I have 1912 to 1917 up here? Because there was another thing that was happening in the late 1800s in this country, specifically around the world of football. That was the ability of football to be used for social change. How many people in the room have heard of the Carlisle Indian School? Right? So for the folks who haven't heard of the Carlisle Indian School, the principle was started down, or the thought behind the Carlisle Indian School was started down in my home state of Florida, down in, outside of Jacksonville, maybe even St. Augustine. The thought behind the school was that there could be a military encampment or a military style school that would help these young Native American youth be assimilated into American society. And one of the ways they would do that was through a number of activities that looked and felt like a military school that you would see today. But when they moved the, Indians, the Carlisle, they moved the original military school from Jacksonville, Florida to Pennsylvania, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, they had to figure out some way to keep the young men engaged on campus. You see, these Native American students had come from Oklahoma and places out west where they had wide ranges to run and play and jump and interact with one another. And the people who were administrators at the school were increasingly frustrated by the fact that the young men would continue to run away because they wanted to go back home. See, the government had sold to the chiefs and the leaders of these tribes that if they would let their youth come back to the East Coast, they would teach them in the ways of the United States of America, and they would be integrated into our society. But they didn't believe them, right? And it took a while before they would even think about listening to them. The only way, or the main way, or the primary way they would get these guys to engage was through sport. And even that wasn't enough. It wasn't until they found a lawyer from Cornell University who wanted to coach football more than he wanted to practice law, and they brought him down to the Carlisle Indian School. A young man by the name of Glenn Warner, who was great in college, he played Cornell himself, and after he got done with his playing career, he had played for some semi-pro teams and then decided that maybe I want to go continue to coach and help young men become as great as I thought I was when I was playing football but he didn't have an opportunity to coach, and coach at the college level. Instead, he had to start at the high school level, and he had heard about this new Carlisle Indian School that was playing against many of the major league colleges that were winning football games at the time. And he thought if he could put his system in place that those young men at the Carlisle Indian School would also be able to compete. That man, Glenn Warner, would become known to many people around the country by his nickname, Pop. And one of the young men at the school gave him that nickname, Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe was very important to the history of football, not just at the Carlisle Indian School and not just through his relationship with Glenn Warner, but because Jim Thorpe would later become one of the deciding voices in the organization of the American Professional Football Association, which would come about three years after this when I flip to the next slide. But back to the Carlisle Indian School. So as I mentioned, this is one of the first interactions between government and football, one of those political footballs that had to do something. One of the biggest stories about the Carlisle Indian School was one of the games that they had against an Ivy League school at the New York Polo Grounds. The New York Polo Grounds was a very festive place, and playing against an Ivy League school with essentially a high school or a boarding school at the time meant that you were showing the world that these young men, these young Native Americans, had the ability to compete against some of the best and the brightest from the top families in the United States of America that were playing at this Ivy League school. And the news reports from the time, if you'll go back and read any of them, there's an interesting book by Sally Jenkins on the entire es escapades out of the Carlisle Indian School will show you that those young men competed against those colleges and they were very successful. Jim Thorpe left the Carlisle Indian School and went on to do a number of other things through not only the Olympics, but also becoming a professional baseball player, a professional basketball player, and most importantly for me, a professional football player. So, in the second quarter we get to 1920, but before 1920 you had as I mentioned before, Jim Thorpe, who was playing for the Canton Bulldogs. 
Jim Thorpe was a Native American. He was uh, from the Oklahoma area, uh, from parts out west. And once he got into a system that had him being very concentrated on playing sports, after he got past the fact that they took back his Olympic medals because they thought he was playing professional baseball at the same time he won Olympic medals for uh, in the decathlon, uh, he decided to concentrate his energy on playing football. But he didn't think that he was just good enough to play for the Canton Bulldogs that was playing in a regional Ohio-based conference at the time. He thought, my team can beat anyone. So at a car dealership in Heptomobile, Ohio, he called together the owner of the team and the owners of several other teams in the area and said, perhaps we should create a national football league instead of these regional football conferences. Perhaps we should get out of this mill town environment and put together a business structure around the game of football that'll show the world how great this game is and perhaps even recruit some of these players from college into the professional ranks. And as a result of that meeting, what was born? The American Professional Football Association founded in 1920. So from 1920 and 1921, uh, you have only three teams that remain in the National Football League. Now, I only have 35 minutes, so I would ask if anyone remembers the teams that were still around from the first 1920 season of the National Football League when it was still the American Professional Football Association. But I won't waste time doing that. There are only two teams that are still around. At 1921, Green Bay Packers, Chicago Bears is one that was originally called the Decatur Staley's, and there's one other team. No, it was also from Chicago, it was the Chicago Cardinals. So the Chicago Cardinals and the Chicago Bears both played in the same city, both founded on the same principles, both kept the legacy of the NFL alive while the other 11 teams that were in, or the other 10 teams that were in the National Football League in its original first couple seasons continued to add teams and drop teams off as financial situations occurred. The original licensing fee was something like 250 bucks. You could have bought an NFL team and you could have put together a team and you could have had your leather helmets and you could have played in the NFL. Wouldn't I like to take that deal now? The great part about that first season in the National Football League was that the National Football League was an integrated league. Even the first season in 1920 included guys like Fritz Pollard, who helped them win the first championship in the, National, in the American Professional Football Association. And in 1921, while playing for the Akron Pros, he continued to coach for the team as well, becoming the first African-American coach and player in the National Football League. And he would later recruit guys like Paul Robeson that would also play in the National Football League as a way for him to earn a living while he was going to Columbia Law School. That legacy continued until around 1933. So in 1933, you had four or five owners that came in at the same time. You had Tim Mara with the New York Giants. He wanted a football team in his hometown of New York. You had George Preston Marshall, who was a guy who had made a bit of money out in business and decided that he wanted to get into this game, this game of football. You had Art Rooney. Art Rooney was a young man who loved sports from the time that he was a young scamp running around in the great city of Pittsburgh. And you had another man by the name of Burt Bell. Burt Bell was a former quarterback from the University of Pennsylvania who had also coached on a staff at Temple University and the University of Pennsylvania with Glenn Scobie Warner once he left the Carlisle Indian School. These four men decided that they would change the way football was played in the country with Burt Bell taking a leadership position on helping them change the Pennsylvania blue laws uh, in the state of Pennsylvania that prevented you from playing football on Sunday afternoons. So in order to encourage the expansion into the state of Pennsylvania out of Ohio and out of New York, they worked together with the legislators in the state of Pennsylvania through relationships that Burt Bell's father had to help change the Quaker rules that said no gambling, no sports, no alcohol on Sundays. See, prior to 1933, for all those years, including the years where the, uh, the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets were the team outside of Philadelphia instead of the Philadelphia Eagles, they had to play games in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania on Saturday. So it made for those teams very difficult times because they would play a game on Saturday and then they would have to go somewhere else and play a game on Sunday, back-to-back -back games. 
but they came up with a new style. They said, we have to have games on Sundays and a uniform schedule around the country. And they came up with this idea because they were all hanging around the Saratoga racetracks, which is uh, in New York. It was one of their favorite activities. Uh, they go to Saratoga, they would drink a lot of alcohol, beverage, alcoholic beverages, and they would come up with ideas on how they could improve the game of football. Well, Burt Bell didn't have as much money as the other guys, as Art Rooney and Tim Mara and George Preston Marshall, but he was really good at picking horses. So they said, if you can help us change the law, we would, we would lend you the money to purchase your NFL franchise, and we would all go into the NFL together. And they did, with George Preston Marshall purchasing the franchise in Boston, with Art Rooney purchasing the franchise originally in Pittsburgh, and then with Tim Mara purchasing the franchise in New York. But there was one other part of the legacy that was left out of that conversation. It was the last year, 1933, when they all entered in the National Football League that you would see African Americans play in National Football League for a while. Between 1933 and 1946, there were no African American players in the National Football League. In fact, while stories haven't been proven, the conversation was around whether they would be able to encourage more people to come to football games if they didn't see African-American players on the field. You see, football players always earned more in this era as it is now, as it was then, than the general population. And you had a general population that was just coming out of the Depression that was seeing football players earn a salary that was much higher than the national average salary of everyone else in the stands. And there were people and articles and news reports saying should African Americans, should black people have the opportunity to earn that money. So who were these two last guys that were in the National Football League in 1933? First, you had Ray Kemp. Ray was a young man who had grown up in Pittsburgh. He had gone to Duquesne University. He was a friend of the Rooney's. He had played for the J.P. Rooney's, which was a semi-pro team that was there in Pittsburgh. And he was also a former player for Elmer Layden, who had been one of the commissioners of the first iteration of the National Football League. Ray had been very successful at every level of the game, including for an African-American player being listed on a number of All-American teams. In 1933, he played his last season and then went on to become a coach at Duquesne University. And then you had Joe Lillard, who was a little bit more remarkable. He played at the University of Oregon as a running back. Now, you're probably looking like, I've never heard of this guy. Why have I never heard of him? I have no idea why you haven't heard of him. But I will tell you this, after today, you're probably gonna Google him. And here's why. Because Joe didn't really play high school football. After Joe left high school, he couldn't afford to go to college, but he had a coach that he wanted to play for at the University of Minnesota. And he took a job driving a bus and playing semi-pro baseball to earn the money so that he could pay his scholarship to go to University of Minnesota. But by the time he had earned the money to pay for his scholarship to go to University of Minnesota, the coach had left and gone to the University of Oregon. He's 28 years old at this point. Clearly, he shouldn't be playing football. Clearly, he shouldn't be on a college field. But he went to the University of Oregon and he showed up with the money to pay for his classes and he said, if you'll give me a shot, I'll come out on the field and I'll play for you. But at the time, you had to play on the freshman team. You couldn't play on the varsity team. Well, they waived the rule, allowed him to play on the varsity team. He plays in a couple games for the University of Oregon. And his play was so good that it created a controversy that allowed them to bring in a commissioner for the first time of what is now known as the Pac-12. The commissioner comes in just to do a special investigation on where this kid came from at the University of Oregon and they suspend him from playing for the University of Oregon for the rest of the season because they didn't want him to compete against the University of Southern California. He has to leave the college ranks and eventually gets into the pros. And once he gets into the pros, he is also successful in the pros. But at this point, you have two, two totally different players. Ray Kemp, who was a friend uh, and, and was less militant about his ascension into the National Football League, and Joe Lillard, who had fought every step of the way to get into the National Football League and wasn't as accepting of some of the things that people were saying to him because of his race. So you had people that would place Ray, on Ray Kemp the responsibility of being a person that was socially acceptable versus Joe Lillard, a person who was fighting against society to get what he thought he was owed after all these years of coming to this space. And as a result, those were the two last young men that were playing in the National Football League. 
they had very different exits with Ray Kemp going on to play and coach and having a very good life with Joe Lillard then disappearing from society, not really being heard from again. So between 1933 and 1946, the NFL continues to develop as a business enterprise. In 1938, you have your first televised NFL game. 1939, you have your first US Supreme Court justice in the future, become a running back out of the University of Colorado, playing in the National Football League. Uh, through the 1940s, you have a number of different iterations of football teams joining together to combine forces because of the, uh, the effects of war the Second World War on their finances and also on their fanhood. Uh, and some interesting stories came out of this, right? So even after 1946, you had a number of teams that were working together in ways that they hadn't before 1946 because they were still dealing with uh, the loss in finances from um, some of the operations having to be shut down and reopened as a result of the Second World War. But there's one particular story that I like to tell around this time. There was a guy that came into the National Football League in 1938, and he was probably the most important person that has ever played football in this country. I slowed down so that that statement could be extra dramatic. His name is Bill Radovich. Now, I know you guys all have like Bill Radovich posters on your wall and, and probably even have a Bill Radovich jersey somewhere in your neighborhood. Uh, I'm sure somebody has one. But there's a reason why Bill Radovich was the most important person that ever played football in the National Football League. He came out of the University of Southern California in 1938 played for the Detroit Lions from 1938 until 1941 as an offensive lineman weighing all of 198 pounds, six foot tall. After he played for his first three, four years of his NFL contract for the Detroit Lions and World War II broke out, Bill Radovich left his NFL career so that he could go serve in the military. He was a Navy man. He wanted to go serve his country. So for the next few years, he served in the military, in the Navy, from 1942 until approximately 1945. He comes back into the National Football League to play for the Detroit Lions. Well, around 1945, 1946, there was a big buzz saying that there was an NFL team that was going to relocate from Cleveland, the Cleveland Rams, to Los Angeles. Bill Radovich, from Los Angeles, wanted to move back home so that he could be closer to his family, including his father, who had been ill uh, in the Los Angeles area. So he went to the management for the Detroit Lions. He said, hey, you know me. I'm Bill Radovich, most important player in the National Football League ever. I came in in 1938. I played four years for you. I was an all-pro guy. I served the military. I went to the Navy. I fought in World War II. All I want from you now, I've played out my existing contract. Don't option me for my option year. Allow me to go play for the Los Angeles Rams so that I can be closer to my family. And the ownership of the Detroit Lions said, no. We want you to play for the Detroit Lions or you won't play in the National Football League, period. And he said, wait, I should have the option. I'm a player. I have talent. I'm really good. I have this great story that I want to tell and I want to be close to my family as I'm finishing my NFL career. They said, no. Can't happen. So Bill Radovich left the National Football League and tried to go play for the Los Angeles Dons, which were a team in the All-American Football Conference. And once the Los Angeles Dons got wind of a message that was sent allegedly from the National Football League that any team that acquired the rights to Bill Radovich would then be blacklisted from the ability to sell their talents to the National Football League, they let him go. Bill Radovich was out of football. Bill Radovich had to go get a job at the Brown Derby, selling pie and waiting on tables in Los Angeles to support his family, including his father who was sick. One day when Bill Radovich was serving pie and coffee in the Brown Derby, a lawyer came in and said, hey, I know you. You're the most important player that ever played football. No, he didn't say that. But he did say, I remember you. You're Bill Radovich from USC. I remember the stories about you leaving the football to go fight in the war in the Navy in World War II. And you came back and you were still a good football player. Why are you here serving me in the Brown Derby instead of out there playing in the National Football League? And Bill Radovich retold his story about how he had been blacklisted from football. Well, what Bill didn't know was that Joseph had just left the Department of Justice in their antitrust division. 
And what he didn't know was that Joseph would take his case and that from 1949 until 1957, Bill Radovich would have an advocate that would fight all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States and eventually win the case Bill Radovich versus the NFL. And in that case, it would finally be said that the NFL had discriminated against the rights of Bill Radovich and that they owed him quite a bit of money and salary for that discrimination. And while they would win the case, he would eventually settle and receive a payment that would help him live a much more comfortable life for the rest of his life. Bill Radovich would always be known as the most important player in the National Football League for one particular reason. Out of that case that went to the Supreme Court, you would find for the first time that the rules of antitrust law would apply to the National Football League. See, prior to this, the NFL was operating under the understanding that they would have the same antitrust exemptions that baseball would have. And that those antitrust exemptions, because football was a game similar to baseball, would apply to the business operations, the way that they would set up their schedule and the many of the operations that the NFL was doing at the time. But out of the case, Bill Radovich versus the NFL, the NFL said, no, many of the things you're doing, National Football League, also violate antitrust law. And if you continue to do them, we will continue to enforce antitrust laws against you, and you may be sued by more players for doing these things. The only way you can get around this is perhaps having a bargaining unit on the other side of the table. Well, wouldn't you know it, in 1956, just a year before this case was brought before the Supreme Court, a ragtag group of guys in both Cleveland, Ohio, and Green Bay had got together for what was called the Socks and Jocks campaign, and they founded the NFL Players Association in December of 1956. And the NFL looked around after they got the decision in the Bill Radovich versus the NFL case, and they said, well, perhaps if we negotiate with these guys over here, listen to their demands, maybe we can get out of additional scrutiny from the National Football League being before the Supreme Court of the United States. Bill Radovich, the most important man that you've never heard of in the National Football League. So I'll take a step back from 1956 and 57 and go back to 1946, which is where this page ends. Surely I said that in 1933, there were the last two guys that were African-American that played in the National Football League, but we saw the return of African-Americans to the National Football League as well. Remember Bill Radovich wanted to play for the LA Rams? Well, the LA Rams didn't come into existence until 1946. And one of the things the LA Rams wanted to do was play in the LA Coliseum. And the LA Coliseum was built using public funds. But because the National Football League wasn't integrated, many of the people in Los Angeles, including some of the sports writers, including some of the politicians, decided that they could not move a National Football Team, National Football League team, into a stadium that was built with public funds if they were practicing racial discrimination. So the National Football League looked around including in their home in the small area of Los Angeles to see who is the best football player that I can find that helped me bring a football team to the Los Angeles area that included an African-American player. They went no further than the campus of UCLA. And they said, hey, they had this great running back at UCLA that graduated back in like 1941. And this guy, I think he played baseball too, but he was a really great running back for UCLA. And uh, I think his name is uh, Jackie something. Jackie Robinson, yeah, that's the guy. He played football at UCLA. We can get that guy to come play for us in the National Football League for the LA Rams. <laughs> Done deal. We'll get the people in the government on our side. The people in the Los Angeles area will love us to death. The only problem with that is by this point, Jackie Robinson has left football alone completely. He's concentrated completely on baseball. So wait, there were two other guys that were in the backfield with Jackie Robinson while he was at UCLA. One, Kenny Washington, and the other, Woody Strode, both best friends, both having better records at football than Jackie Robinson when he was at UCLA, and both great football players still. They had both been toiling away in the All-American Football League for one and the Pacific Coast Football League for another over the last few years because those were the only options they had. Remember, the NFL wasn't accepting African-American players. So one would sign a contract first, the other would play first, but they would both reintegrate football in 1946. 
If you're interested in getting more of that story, there's a unique movie that's out right now called The Forgotten Four that tells the story of Kenny Washington, Woody Strode, but it also talks about Marion Motley and Bill, uh, Bill Willis, who came out of Ohio State, and Marion Motley, who came out of the United States Navy, playing for the Navy football team. How they, four individuals, integrated football in the 1946 and 47 season. Again, Jackie Robinson integrated baseball in 1947, and every year, in 19, every year, the number 42 jersey is is adorned by players throughout Major League Baseball in celebration of the great work that Jackie Robinson did. But most people never hear the story of Kenny Washington and Woody Strode, who integrated football full year before they did, before he did. Okay. So we'll talk about the next third quarter. I forgot, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter. 1961. So now you have a team in Los Angeles. You've gotten this case, Bill Radovich versus the NFL, that says you have to have a union on the other side. Uh, how can we grow the game of football? All these competing football leagues had never quite grown up enough to grow the game of football. and still an NFL-dominated environment. Well, in 1960, there were a few guys that wanted to buy NFL franchises but couldn't because the NFL guys didn't want to sell them to them. They said, I don't know you. I've been around the game of football since 1920 or 1921 or 1933. You are new money guys that want to come in here and change the way we're doing it. You want cheerleaders, you want names on jerseys and all this stuff. That's not football. Football is no name on the back of the jersey, logo on the side of the helmet, solid color tops, white pants, black pants, that's football, right? And so these billionaires out of Texas and oil guys that had a little bit of money in their pockets decided that they would invest their own funds in, creation, in the creation of the American Football League. Now, this was the fourth iteration of the American Fush Football League. They went and found the blueprint, dusted it off, invested more money in the American Football League than they had seen before, but they had one critical change to the way they put together the American Football League. Something that was new than the other, four, the other three iterations, television. So immediately when they created the American Football League, they negotiated a television contract that would allow their games to be broadcast over one of the smaller networks out of the big three at the time. And because of the revenue from the television contracts that they were able to negotiate, the American Football League was for the first time able to give the NFL a run for its money, including paying its players a much higher salary than the other NFL teams had been able to play before then or had been willing to pay before then. So in 1961, the NFL, actually to two steps back, 1958, the NFL had a great year. 1959, Burt Bell is the commissioner of the National Football League, coming off of the Bill Radovich versus the NFL loss before the Supreme Court. He goes to Congress to try to get an exemption from the antitrust laws. But one day while he's in a Philadelphia Eagles game, he is eating hot dogs in the stands, as he was known to do, even as a commissioner. He liked to hang out with the regular people. The game got really exciting. He had a heart attack and died at the football game. So in 1960, they had to bring in a new commissioner. Well, the guy that they decided to bring in as their commissioner was a young man who had worked for the LA Rams back in the day as a PR guy. But they didn't want him on the first ballot. They didn't want him on the second ballot. In fact, the owners had to vote 26 times before he was voted in as the next commissioner of the National Football League. But Pete Rozelle would be his name, and he would come into the National Football League full of vim and vigor. And he would have an understanding of how the portrayal of the National Football League would be the most important thing to change the game going forward. And one of the ways he can control that portrayal of the National Football League was by negotiating contracts for NFL teams across the board as it related to their television contracts. See, prior to 1961, when Pete Rozelle came up with this idea, contracts were being negotiated individually by NFL teams. The average NFL team was making between $50,000 per year on their TV rights on the low end to $375,000 a year on the high end with the New York Giants. 
Pete Rozelle said, perhaps if we put together a package of all the NFL teams together so that it could be a contest that would be able to, to, to be witnessed across the nation and you would have dedicated programming, perhaps we can get more money out of these NFL contracts with these TV negotiations. But that would be illegal because we are negotiating collective contracts without an exemption from Congress. So we went to Congress and talked to them. This is the political part of the conversation. Congress then passes the Sports Broadcast Act Sports Broadcasting Act of 1961, and as a result of the Sports Broadcasting Act of 1961, those television contract rights went from, at the high end, $375,000 to approximately a million dollars a year from 1962 forward. And in fact, since 1962, they've compounded annually at a rate of about 13%. So now, NFL contract television rights worth about $4.5 billion per year all based on one decision in 1961 to go for the Sports Broadcasting Act of 1961 and support the members of Congress that were supporting them. So, from 1961 until 1966, the NFL and the AFL continued to compete for talent. But what we saw on the player side of the table was a competing salary race, right? Your big name players started getting big money contracts for the first time. Back in 1957, when I told you that the NFL Players Association finally came into the mix, they were looking for a $5,000 minimum salary. Well, in this period, between 1961 and 1966, we saw Joe Namath come into the National Football League and get a $427,000 contract, simply because there was competition for his talent for the first time. Now, that doesn't mean the AFL was making money. The AFL was doing well, and the AFL had negotiated television contracts, but the AFL was relying very heavily on the owner of the Kansas City Chiefs bankrolling the operations. In fact, his father said when asked, do you know how much money your son has put into the AFL? He was given a number of somewhere close to almost half a billion dollars at this point. This is around 1962 or 63. His dad laughed and said, well, given the amount of money I've put in his trust fund, he shouldn't be able to last any longer than 2035 at that rate. <laughs> so, the NFL and the, NFL, the AFL continued to fight each other for most of the 60s until the late 60s happened. In 1966, the NFL finally saw a vision. They said, perhaps if we can get these guys with great business sense to adapt and move into our league and take the moniker of the National Football League across the board, perhaps we can go from a 14-team uh, a, a league to a 26-team league by absorbing their 12 teams and make even more money together. And what we can definitely ensure is we'll stop competing for talent, stop doing things like kidnapping players so that they don't sign with a competing team. Yes, that happened. Look up the story of Billy Cannon out of LSU in the 1960s. It's great stuff, but I don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> So in 1966, there was this great conversation or great anecdote about what happened uh, with the eventual amendment to the Sports Broadcasting Act of 1961. Um, also very political. So Pete Rozelle goes back to Congress and he says, hey, remember that Sports Broadcasting Act of 1961 that you passed for me so that I can get these TV contracts? Guess what? I need you to amend that slightly because I want to merge together with the only other business in my industry and that too would be illegal. It would be the essence of Target merging with Walmart and saying, hey, should we do this so that we can make even more money? That would never happen. I am in Arkansas. 1966. So he goes to Congress and he has this conversation. And there are two guys that figure out that this is a way for us to make the best deal for our state. Those guys, Huey Long, senator from Louisiana, and Hale Boggs, congressman from New Orleans. They say, well, perhaps, why should we care about this since there's no football team in the New Orleans or Louisiana area? Maybe we should just not have a vote. Maybe we shouldn't just bring, we should not bring this to the floor. Well, Pete Rozelle catches wind that they're about to kill his amendment to the Sports Broadcasting Act of 1961 um, because Hale Boggs has taken jurisdiction of the bill from, uh, of the amendment from the Judiciary Committee and brought it over to his committee and put it on a budget bill. He tacked on an amendment to the Sports Broadcasting Act to the budget bill knowing full well that the budget bill would pass and that he had full jurisdiction over that bill. 
And as he was walking into the vote for his subcommittee, he had Pete Rosell walking with him and said, well, before I go in for this vote, I just want to make sure that we're clear. The New Orleans area is getting a football team, right? And Pete Rosell said, well, I'm only the commissioner of the National Football League. I can't promise you a team in the National Football League, but what we'll do is we'll work really hard to work with the other owners to get you a team. And the stories go that Hale Boggs immediately turned around on his heels and said, well, that's it, I'm canceling the vote, and walked off. And Pete Rosell ran after him and said, I tell you what, I can't guarantee it, but I promise you I'm gonna work really hard on it. Hale Boggs returns to the subcommittee room, they have the vote, bill pass, the amendment passes, gets to the floor, gets attached to the bill, the bill passes, the budget bill passes, and within two weeks, a letter is sent to the newspapers of New Orleans announcing the New Orleans Saints as the next franchise in the National Football League, the 1960s. So shortly thereafter, between 1966 and 1970, the AFL and the NFL work out how they can merge together as one. And one of the things that was an outgrowth of that was the Super Bowl, right? So the first two games happened, they're actually called the AFL-NFL championship games. And then the third game happens and it's actually finally labeled the Super Bowl. One of the things that Pete Rozelle realized at that moment was that the NFL had finally captured the nation's attention. See, prior to that, all these things were happening and people watched football, but it still wasn't a national sport that we see today. Pete Rozelle came up with the idea that perhaps we can make it the sport that we see today if we, view, if we infuse some of the military stories of our past. So for the first time, he started involving veterans in the game. At the third Super Bowl was the first time you saw a flyover by Jets of a game in the National Football League. And he also encouraged the Department of Defense to invite the military members out because they were having a hard time selling tickets to give all the members of the military tickets to the Super Bowl in the third game. Tickets to the Super Bowl cost 15 bucks. 15. And they still couldn't sell it out. Right. And that all worked well. The NFL had finally started making money. They were making millions of dollars off their TV contracts, and they were doing everything the right way except treating their players the right way. The players' salaries were still depressed. In fact, in 1970, the average player salary, even though Broadway Joe Namath was making $427,000, average player salary was $12,000 a year. Between $12,000 and $25,000 a year, depending on the caliber of play that you had for your NFL team. And you had no rights to leave that NFL team. In fact, you had to figure out how there was no way for you to transfer your talents to another team. You were stuck with that team for the rest of your NFL career. What was originally called the option clause became known as the Roselle rule. And if you were to leave your team, if you were to not take that option of staying with your NFL team and another team was to make an option or try to purchase your talents so that you can be on their team, they would have to then go to Pete Roselle. And Pete Roselle would have to make the final determination as to what the buying team would have to pay the selling team. Yes, you would have to pay the selling team either cash, draft picks, or cash and draft picks. And there was no ruling by Pete Rozelle that, was, that would have allowed a player to move from one team to the other. There was no free agency in football still. And this is the late 1970s. So because of that in 1974, you have your first work stoppage in the National Football League. It's widely known as a strike, but in actuality what happened was a lockout. The players showed up for camp, but they were disgruntled about what was happening, and the NFL owners, thinking that they were going to strike, immediately locked the players out. And in 1974, you missed your first games in football because of labor movements that had brought themselves into the game, primarily requesting the ability to move from one team to another. Players were asking to be treated like any other worker anywhere else in the United States of America. If I have talents and another company wants to purchase my talents or pay me more money, I want the ability to go to that place to, pay, to, to work for that company so that I can earn that money. The strike in 1974 or the lockout in 1974 that led to a strike was short-lived and it wasn't as successful as it could have been because the players eventually crossed the picket line. Why is that important? Because early in 1981, fourth quarter, the NFL owners decided that they wanted to test free agency. 
See, while the NFL owners didn't want players to have the ability to move from one team to another, the NFL owners themselves decided that they wanted to move their teams from one city to another. The owners wanted free agency while denying that same right to the players. But the players themselves said, well, we've been fighting for free agency for years. Actually, since the NFL Players Association started in 1956, this has been one of the list of demands, but it's never been met. So we've decided to change our philosophy. And in 1982, they for the first time decided to go after a percentage of the gross as the requirement for a negotiation with the NFL. The NFL had started making a lot of money. And approximately in 1982, they were making about $2 billion a year in revenue. And the players thought if they could get 55% of that revenue on their side of the table, perhaps they would be able to be OK with not being able to see free agency or go play for a different team in the National Football League. We had our second big labor issue in 1987. Most of you may remember this as the Shane Falco year. The movie The Replacements was actually an actual thing. Players in the National Football League went on strike for a number of weeks, and games were missed and players were brought in from all over the place, including some uh, not so nice places uh, to play on National Football League teams because they had TV contracts that said these games must be played in order for you to receive this revenue. So the games went on in the 1987 season. I'm going through this quickly because I want to make sure that I have time for questions and answers. Uh, in 1993, finally for the first time after a lawsuit had been filed in 1992 by a football player from Minnesota named Fred McNeil, uh, the settlement of that lawsuit led to the 1993 collective bargaining agreement, which led finally to free agency in football. Coincidentally, in 1994, there was a strike in baseball, and for the first time, baseball was off the air while football was being played very prominently in this country. And we were able to see how Players being able to move from team to team allowed coaches to find the pieces that they needed to put together cha uh, championship caliber teams throughout the National Football League. Salaries rose dramatically between 1982 and 1993. There was one other thing that happened called the USFL, but I won't talk about that because we don't have time, and Donald Trump is still Donald Trump. Uh, and then between 1993, 2001, and the present, We've had a number of issues that came up, including steroids, violence, and dealing with the future of football. Now, I'm sure I'll get some questions about that stuff, so I'll stop here and I'll defer if this is the time for question and answer. Thank you, Joe. Yes. We do have time for a couple of questions, so raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you, Jen. Thank you. I have two different questions. One deals with the um, boycott of the New Orleans All-Star Game with the AFL. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. And then also, too, please, um, I'd like to hear what the Players Association response is to the domestic violence issues that are going on. Mike Singletary, I was very impressed with what he said here in town last month dealing with that. Okay. So first, the AFL All-Star Game. Uh, it was a tradition in the 60s and I think as far back as the 50s for the top college football players. I'm guessing this is the All-Star Game. No, this is the AFL one where they, had the, where they were getting the African American players complaining about their treatment and discrimination and they moved the game to Houston. Yes. So uh, one of the, one of the, one of the outgrowths of outreach to African-American players was that when there was conversation around the poor treatment they were receiving as a result of uh, them hosting an AFL championship game in a certain area, they moved the game to another city. Uh, there was still underlying issues. In fact, uh, there are some classic stories that I've heard in locker rooms around in, in conversations around that. But generally what you saw in the National Football League was uh, respect from ownership for African American players that continue to increase with an understanding of how much talent those African American players had. Uh, and because of that, as a result of that, many of the sports writers at the time in the 1950s and 60s likened the 
player mo player centric movements, including the NFL Players Association ascension from 1960 through 1974, when the first labor uh, strife to the Black Power movement, right? They said that many of the players that were on the front line, if you even look at some of the names, John Mackey, African-American tight end from the Baltimore Colts, uh, and even the eventual leader of the Players Association for 25 years, and Gene Upshaw, were African-American men who had come into the National Football League during this time period. It was a very interesting story around the movement of the AFL um, All-Star Game uh, to Houston. Uh, but one of the things that was mo more interesting to me is the treatment of John Mackey after he came out as the president of the NFL Players Association during that same time period. You see, John Mackey was the top tight end in the National Football League for the Baltimore Colts. He hadn't lost a step, but he had helped the Colts go all the way to an, a Super Bowl, uh, an NFL championship game as the tight end, top tight end playing uh, for the team. But the very next season, after he came out as the president of the NFL Players Association and started pushing back against NFL management, they cut him. And in fact, for the next three years in the National Football League, you being the player representative for your team to the NFL Players Association almost guaranteed that you were going to lose your job the next season, if not during that season itself. Uh, but again, after, again and again, many of those player reps on those teams um, continued to fight for what they believed was right, and including the merger of the two. Uh, one of the other stories, and I'll get to the second question in a second, uh, but I think this is important. Uh, the president of the AFL Players Association, because they had their own Players Association, uh, and John Mackey, uh, who was the president of the NFL Players Association, had to determine who would be the leader of this new organization once the two merged. Uh, and John Mackey ended up winning out in that race, being elected by his peers to be the president of the Players Association. Uh, but the person who he ran against was Jack Kemp, who would eventually become a vice presidential candidate in the United States of America. So you had quality leadership on both sides of the table, and they began to recognize the talent even beyond the race of the individuals that were in the room. And then your second question, again, the, about domestic violence. Um, there's no way to get around it. Uh, Domestic violence is a problem, not just in the National Football League, but across the country. And I don't know that there, you would find anyone in the, any of the executive offices on either side of the table, the NFL or the NFL Players Association, that would say different, that we have to figure out a way to get it right. And that means providing the necessary services to our players so that they can understand what's right and what's wrong. And, and many of them do. Most of them do, I would argue. But what we have to do is also support the, the people on the other side of the, the equation as well, the people that aren't our members, the women that are in their lives, and make sure that they have the adequate resources to not only report instances where they don't feel safe, but also that they have a system in place to help them through that situation. And what you've seen from the NFL Players Association is an assembly of a panel of experts that can help us create protocols around just that. How do we make sure that our players understand what the boundaries are, but how do we also put together support services for the people in their lives that may need them should they go down a path that requires them to call out for it? I, I, don't, I don't know uh, if you've seen any of the reports from Demora Smith and his comments on it. He's the head of the Players Association. I'll echo what he said. There's no place in the game, no place in the National Football League for domestic violence, period. Full stop. Hmm. One second, one second, Aaron, behind you. Great article in the New York Times, I guess about a month ago or two months ago, about the new person that's heading up the NFL Players Union. Tell us a little bit about her, uh, her background, and how the players have responded to her. So I think you're talking about Michelle Roberts, who's heading yes. up the NBA Players Association. <laughs> Uh, she has a great background as a former uh, public defender in the Washington, D.C. area. We've had some interactions uh, between the NBA, all the players' associations. We deal with similar issues. We deal with players getting injured. We deal with working conditions and working rights. And also, being in Washington, D.C., while it's a huge town, the lawyers that do this work, we all know each other. What I can say about Michelle is that she's a fair and honest leader that's going to take the NBA to places that I don't think it's been before from the player's perspective. And I think she's going to ask that the players that are members and leaders in her organization uh, take 
responsibility for themselves and the rest of the game that they've inherited from the people who played before them. Uh, I would juxtapose her with the leader of my organization, the NFL Players Association, Demora Smith, who's another lawyer that came in from a federal prosecution background uh, and who has led the NFL Players Association through some pretty tricky times. Uh, but because of his background, because of his excellent knowledge base because of his acumen in business and also in the rights of the people that he represents. He's been able to keep us on a place that the national uh, fan base that we have has continued to grow and you haven't missed any football in the last four years since he's been at the helm. We saw the um baseball go to Congress to settle an issue relating to steroids. Mm -hmm. um, would you just say a little bit about professional sports relate uh, the Roselle issue, that was a contract idea. That seemed to be something that Congress could act on. Mm -hmm. But do you see professional sports looking more and more to Congress to settle issues so they don't have to do it themselves? Uh, you know, actually, I don't think so, especially in the context of performance enhancing drugs. These are things that are best worked on between the two parties because they have a better understanding. And quite frankly, because members of Congress have much more important things that they could be doing with their time, right? And because we have experts on our side of the table that deal with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis, what we understand and what we've seen happen, and this kind of goes back to the domestic violence issue, what we've seen happen on the personal conduct side of our business is that the NFL has unilaterally imposed rules. What we've seen on the drug policy side of our business is that the two sides have worked together to come up with solutions on how we can not only deter the action that got the player there into that situation where they were subject to the drug policy, but help the player so that he doesn't return. And it's been very successful. We've been very successful in doing that. Uh, so I don't think that we'll go back to Congress for help on our drug issues in the National Football League, but I do think Congress will continue asking questions. And I think they should ask questions from time to time because the general public wants to know and we'll answer those questions, and that's part of my job as public policy counsel at the Players Association. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question, do you think that the teams, the professionals, will go back to Congress um, in light of some of the senators wanting to take their nonprofit exemption away from them? So, I think differently on that than I do on the drug policy. On the drug policy issue, it's, uh, it's an insular issue that the Players Association and the NFL can work out and will work out. On the exemption from taxes that the NFL has had since 1942, uh, that was also included in the reorganization in 1966, specifically codified, the NFL is a 501c6. That language was slipped in in that Second Amendment as a part of that conversation with those folks from Louisiana. Uh, I think Congress has a role there. I think Congress has a role specifically because they have given someone power and they should review that power to see if that power is still necessary and still appropriate. Uh, that's different than the drug policy because I think with the drug policy, what we've seen is what's best is deterrence and also figuring out a way to include clinicians in the conversation so the players can get better and not return. Um, <laughs> it, it, no, it wasn't a box. Uh, his name was uh, Diver. I think it was Joe Diver was the name of the person who was leading the conversation. He actually ended up having to pull out, and it was a second person who actually ended up with the purchase of the team, and his name is escaping me right now, but I'm going to remember it before the end. Last one. Nathan, did you have one? No? We had Sorry. Uh, we'll do two more. Two Nathan more. and then him. Yeah. Not to repeat um, her question, but if there is a change in the nonprofit status of the NFL, what kind of effect will players feel from that change in status if that were to happen? Well, quite frankly, with the players, because the players in the NFL are business partners and the revenue that we see we receive as a part of our salary uh, on the player side of the table comes from revenue that's generated by the National Football League. If they, quite frankly, have to begin paying taxes on some of those revenues, then there would be less money in the pot and we would potentially see less money in our salaries. 
the salaries for our players in the National Football League. Now, all of this is obviously hypothetical, uh, and who's to say that they won't change their tax structure in another way? Other professional sports leagues have already walked away from their tax exempt status, and they haven't really seen a, a major decrease in the salaries the players in those leagues have experienced as a result of that. So, uh, do I know that there will be an effect on our side of the table? I don't. Uh, we don't work for the National Football League, and they have great accountants that would probably figure out another way to get the same result. All right. What courses do you teach at Georgetown? <laughs> Uh, I teach a sports business and finance class uh, to graduate students in our sports industry management program. Uh, and I also teach uh, the sports ethics course. Uh, and I'm also a capstone advisor and professor. Uh, so those are the three main courses that I teach and have taught in the past. I've been there now since 2008. So who knows? I teach whatever they ask me to, quite frankly. <laughs> Uh, they, I think they may ask me to teach the sports law class next. I don't know. So whatever they, whatever they tell me to teach at the beginning of the semester, that's what I teach all semester. Well, Joe, thank you so much for uh, visiting us.